Welcome everyone, we're back for the third session of Productivity Power Hour, and today we're here to talk about a Spotlight app that has captured the attention of quite a bit the community when it comes to productivity, and it's called Raycast. And so if you haven't heard about it, don't worry, this is what we're here to talk about today. And uh, yeah, so I mean, there's really no more introduction needed than that, so with that, let's, let's jump right in. All right, great. My screen is up and now let's talk. So what is Raycast? Did they actually get the domain? They did. I just typed it wrong. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so when it comes to productivity tools, one of the things that's really common when it comes to well, just kind of getting things done is being able to start quickly, right? And so whether that's the ability to start up an application or to access something, your launch point is really, really critical because you lose a lot of time in between your context switching. So in the traditional example for those using PCs, you know, in the, in the past, especially prior to like, I wouldn't say like prior to desktop icons, but a lot of times when you wanted to launch something, right? What is the longest user flow that's possible? Well, you hit the start menu. You go to programs and then you look for the, you know, you scroll and you scan and then you're like, oh, maybe I'm looking for Microsoft Office. You'll hit Microsoft Office. Then you'll be like, oh, what's inside of that? And you'll be like, oh, I'm looking for Excel. And so that process in and of itself, while talking about it might have taken like, I don't know, let's call that five seconds, right? Scanning it may probably take maybe a couple seconds less, but that's still precious time that's lost, honestly, context switching, right? And so it's why we started to do things like having shortcuts on your desktop where you just double click your Excel, for example, or like on the Mac as well, we have all our shortcuts here at the bottom that you might click. But then here's the thing though, right? Once you've abstracted that piece of functionality, you still need to switch in order to get it. So in other words, if I'm here and I want to switch to Spotify, for example, I'd have to go down, like move my mouse all the way down, and then I'd have to hunt or like look for the Spotify logo, click on it, and then I'm there. And so eventually someone challenged that and was like, do we really need to hit the mouse every single time? Because if you think about it, if you're in the middle of typing something and you want to switch to an application, really the, uh, the limitation here is your mouse. And so enter sort of spotlight. So if we look at the um, sort of traditional spotlight, from Mac OS, actually, did I disable it? I might have disabled it. Okay, ultimately, what it is, is basically like you see up here at the top, this little like bar that shows up, this is from Alfred, so, and we'll go into this shortly. But basically, it let us do things like just type out what we're looking for. You can see, oh, I'm looking for Spotify, done. And that, even though you, you're saying, oh, well, it takes some keystrokes, right? It's still, ultimately faster than like going down and trying to search for it. And more importantly, there's that less cognitive load because you're going directly to what you want. And so to uh, radio signals question, I will get to you in a moment, promise. So spotlights became a big deal and you know, OSs have implemented them in various ways, but the one that really sort of, I would say, got a lot of love and attention earlier on, especially back when I was starting to really start nerding out about productivity, is Alfred, which is exactly what you see here. It's really minimal. It's just like the bar here and then you can launch applications. But more importantly, there was a lot inside of Alfred that allowed you to do a lot of things as far as like, there were features for like search results. You could configure workflows, clipboard history, calculators. Like, so you could be like, oh, what's 10 or 190 times, you know, this number. And then boom, there's your answer, right? And so this was amazing because it was like, at the time, it was such a big deal to be able to just do these things immediately rather than having to be like, oh, let me like open a calculator app, then let me type in the numbers or any other number of things. And so Alfred was a key part of my workflow for the longest time. And then recently, I had heard about this thing called Raycast and it's been getting a lot of love and attention. And so to Radio Signal's question here in the chat, the question here is, is this an alternative to Alfred? And as Jimena had answered here, it, yep, basically that's what it is. But it basically, how do I say this? It takes what made Alfred popular and then it seems to like leapfrog it. Like because Alfred in a sense started to stagnate from a, from like a development perspective where it was really innovative and people love it. And then after a while it was like, there weren't a lot of updates coming down because I paid for every single update. I think I'm like a whatever mega supporter Alfred four. And then the updates kind of started slowing down. And as we know, especially with software today and how accessible the programming is and being able to release your own apps, it was 
like a lot of things, a matter of time before something came on in to say, I think we can take what we was what we learned from this app and do even better. So a great analogy of this for developers is, for example, prior to VS Code coming onto the scene, it was basically what it was. There was like Atom, there was Sublime Text, and Sublime Text was all the rage, right? And it still is. There are some people who use it; they're very faithful to it because speed, in particular, it's very good at. But there was a sense of like, can we improve the developer experience, the user experience of these applications? And so Raycast, it seems to be,、uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit. It seems to take Alfred and bring it to that next level. So we'll deep dive a little bit more in just a bit. So, with that said, let's start with some standard things you would get with Raycast. So for me,、um, when I want to access my Raycast, basically I'm using Command Space, and so as you can see here, it already has a bunch of suggestions for me, and then there's a bunch of commands which we'll slowly go through. But basically, here let's start with the simple things, right? When you're working with something like a launcher, you want to be able to what? Launch your applications. So, for example, we said VS Code, right? Let's do that one. Visual Studio Code. You see, it's really, really snappy. And then once I hit Enter, it'll go ahead and open VS Code as expected, which is great. And so, if I'm in the middle of VS Code, I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna switch back to Chrome. Command Space. I hit Chrome. Enter. Switch. Nice and easy. Now, what other things? Well. The other thing that we showed earlier with the Alfred, right? Can it do a built-in calculator? Absolutely. So if you ever like, I need a quick math for like, okay, there's 24 hours in the day, and then there's 60 minutes in an hour. Okay, that's how many minutes are in a day, for example.、And、then you're like, oh, how many seconds? We can multiply that by, you know, 60 again, for example.、But、then you can be like,、oh, okay, there you go. And what's kind of neat though is that they also have like the the word here in addition. So if I hit, I think Enter, for example, what it'll do is it'll actually copy it directly to the clipboard, so I can go ahead and paste it wherever it is, and it's already formatted, which is really nice.、Uh, so that's like you know a little bit of again, that's fairly standard, honestly, overall. Now, okay, here's a fun one that's built in that I think. Let me see if Alfred can do it. So if I go into Alfred, right, and let's say time zone convergence to me are always tricky, particularly when we go to Europe. So if they're like, oh, I'm in CST or CEST, that doesn't like that doesn't really compute for me at this point, right? I haven't totally memorized all the different hours, time zones, and how it relates to me. So if I want to be like, oh, what is it at 8 p.m.? Uh, Eastern to you know CEST. You'll notice that Alfred doesn't really do anything, and I'm sure though there's a community workflow that probably does this for me. But in Raycast, what we have here is a built-in way to switch that. So if I go 8 p.m. EST to CEST, you'll see here that it automatically switches that time zone for me, and more importantly, it, it tells me that the date changed. <laughs> more importantly, so it's like, oh, it's assuming that I meant today, 8 p.m. Eastern, and for Central European time, oh, that's actually 3 a.m. in that time. And that, this is the little stuff that, like, yes, can you Google this? Absolutely. But then, what's that process workflow like? It's like Command T, 8 p.m. EST to CEST. Hit Enter, and then okay, great. So then you finally get it. But then, what do you have to do? You have to switch to Chrome. Then you had to make sure you search in the type like location bar, or maybe you want to open Google for like. There's this. There's a little more friction to that, right? And if we think about productivity at its best, it's about removing friction. So command space, and then your time, and then it just works, right? You don't have to hit enter or anything. It just automatically reads and parses everything for you, which is awesome. Now, what else can it do? Another fun one that it can do that I don't know. I think this is. I find myself doing this more and more, especially as I watch a lot of foreign television shows. So I think Squid Games was a great example of this, where they were like, "Oh, the you know the prize money was like I forgot, like let's say like thirty billion won, right?" So it was like, "Oh, how do I convert that?" Well, what's kind of funny is you could just I think actually to USD like this. Oh, did that not work? Oh, it's supposed to have a currency conversion, USD maybe like this. Oh, there we go to pounds. Okay, apparently I need to memorize the the units, but this is kind of like a fun one, right? Being able to just switch currencies. So again, this kind of like built-in calculator stuff conversion is nice. So actually, now that I think about it, can I do like eight cups to ounces? No, okay. Oh, it does. Oh, incompatible units. It doesn't like it. Fluid ounces? No.、Nah. Okay, I thought I tried. Okay, anyhow. So we have that, and then as always with launchers, you have your normal system commands, right? So if you want to lock your screen rather than having to go up to your upper left and do that kind of stuff, it just works out of the box. You can do sleep and all those fun things. So those are sort of the standard things you come to expect out of a launcher. Now, let's talk about my favorite features, though, when it comes to Raycast. And so, favorite feature number one. Let's see. All right. 
I don't know about y'all, but finding files inside of macOS is particularly, I find it particularly painful to do, right? Because if I have to open up my finder window and then inside my finder window, I'm looking for like a build with Ben, I kind of have to be like, okay, build with Ben. And then it kind of takes a little bit. And then I don't honestly know why all this stuff is showing up, to be honest. And so it's just like, I find that the process, the like the the built-in file searching system in OS, the Mac OS is surprisingly bad. But with Raycast, there's a file search option actually that when I go ahead and hit that and I do build with Ben, you'll see that it is the algorithm is actually very accurate in its sort of ability to locate uh, files. But not just that, look how much information I get for free out like just with this search. And so as you can see, there's a lot of autocomplete and not to mention, you get a preview of the file too. So if you just wanna check what's inside of it before you even like have a chance to actually interact with it, you can do that. And that's great. And then you have all this stuff of like where it is, you know, what type of file it is, its size, like that stuff you normally have to like right click in info or I guess if you do like, so let me give you, let me, let me show what I'm talking about. So typically like here, you can see that like, I can see the kind here. I can see when it was open and then I'm sure you can add different columns, but typically you'd have to right click and you have to go get info. Then you'd have to wait for it to load. Sometimes it takes a little while and then you have to like search within this box to find what you need. It's like the, the file searching experience for me, it just leaves a little to be desired in this regard. So having Raycast being able to just show you all this, and more importantly, by the way, I've been navigating all this stuff with my keyboard, by the way, and we'll talk about keyboard first in a little bit. But file searching is a huge win for me. And then more importantly, like if you hit enter, you'll actually open it in your default editor. But more importantly, you can also do, there's like this little more actions here. And so command K is seeming to become like a UX pattern I'm noticing for like the options menu. So if I hit command K, you'll notice there's all this other stuff you can do too, right? Open with file, toggle details, you can share it, right? And then you can, again, once again, everything is d like done via like keyboard, like you can just type everything. You don't have to click anything. And so if you want to be like show in finder, right? I can just hit that and it'll take me directly to where it is. And so in this one, you'll see it's in my, my ZL cast and it tells me exactly the file that it's in. Yeah, so this is the file searching feature here. It's just so snappy that I just like this, well, I wouldn't say this alone would sell me on it, but the, like R Alfred was pretty good about the file searching, but Rake has, they must have done something to the indexing algorithm. So this is so good. I switched Obsidian's open command from command to command can because I was so used to it from Slack. Yeah, that's from Chelming here uh, in the chat. Yeah, honestly, command K, I think is going to become a keyboard shortcut. People are going to become very familiar with similar to our command C, command V, you know, so... I, I'm excited, honestly. I love the command palette keyboard first mentality that seems to be coming towards a lot of productivity apps because remember, it doesn't stop you from using the mouse. So right now, if I just wanna scroll myself, I can just click, that's totally fine. But it shouldn't stop keyboard users from being able to navigate and especially like access those shortcuts. And not to mention, and we're talking about accessibility as well, this means that users who aren't able to use the mouse can just use things, like can just type things and that kind of stuff. And that to me is a huge win on multiple fronts. So again, big props to them for, for doing that. Okay, we have searching files. Now, here's another one that a lot of us don't talk about, but it's funny when I see people like share screen on Zoom and then they're, they're like sitting there like dragging their windows and trying to like get them to resize. I, I always find that really fascinating because I don't know about y'all, but for me, eventually I was like, I just, I need to, I need, I need certain dimensions. I need it just to work. And so I used to use an app called Magnet. I think another one that was popular was called, oh gosh, uh, Spectacle. That's a really popular free one actually. So if you're looking for just window managers, those are like my two. And actually let me write that down so people can remember that. So let me just write Spectacle and then Magnet. Those are my, the window managers that I've used in the past with, with a good amount of success. And so what I mean by window managers, by the way, is that if I want to go 50% left, all I did honestly was hit three keys. I hit the, my hyper key, which I'll explain in a little bit and then left and I can go right. I can go up, I can go down. And then I have keys to go whether I wanted two thirds or one third, right? This is how I'm able to do that so quickly rather than measuring things out. Because frankly, there are probably certain proportions you're using a lot. And so why shouldn't those be bound to keyboard shortcuts? And the thing is, is that this is actually built into Raycast. So if we go into here and we look at window management, check this out. They have a bunch of different pre-built options for what exactly you want. So whether it's the second, fourth, like look, so we can be like, look, this is gonna be my second, fourth. Let's see, this is gonna be my third, fourth. 
And then, what the heck, let me grab my obsidian over here. And then let's make this my, that's not what I wanted. Stop, 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 stop. And then I'll make it my fourth fourth, last fourth. And like, look at that. It's like really easy window management. But don't worry if you're like, oh, that's that's a decent amount of typing. Now we can talk a little bit about hotkeys, right? So if we go into here and look at, let's see, uh, not appearance. Okay, here we go. Extensions. Actually, can I bump this at all? Can I make Raycast any bigger? It doesn't look like it can. Oh, that's something I wish. Oh, wait, appearance. Here we go. Better. Okay, it's a little bigger. That's fine. I'll deal. I'll, that, I'll accept. I'll take that. Okay, so inside of here, we'll see a bunch of different integrations. We'll talk more about this in a little bit. But you'll notice that, let's say window management, right? So window management is all here. You'll notice you can record a specific hotkey for whatever you want to do. And so all you got to do is click into it, and that's it. You just do whatever you want. So maybe first third for me is like Control-Shift-F, for example, or Control-Alt-F. That will be my first third. And basically, you don't have to configure it if you're not going to use it. That's basically what I recommend, unless you have options you're using constantly. So for me, my popular ones are basically like 50% left, right. Occasionally, I do top down, but it was easy enough to have up, right, left, down that I was like, fine, I configured that. So you can see here, bottom half. Oh, so this is the hyper key, by the way. If you're looking at this syntax, it's command, control, shift, and command, control, shift, alt all in one button. So basically my caps lock has been remapped to hit four modifier keys at once so that I only have to hit one modifier key and then I can pair that with an additional macro. And the reason I like doing that a lot is because one, even though there's a little bit of a barrier of entry to setting that up, what that allows you to do is basically create macros that basically never ever conflict with any other application because I can't imagine an app that would make a user hit four different keys at once or actually, I guess five plus keys. So you gotta hit the four modifier keys in addition to the one. And so it's been really nice because I don't have to worry about conflicting with anything. And as a result, the uh, the hyper key has been really big for unlocking macros. So if you're into keyboard shortcuts, maybe I should honestly just do a dedicated session on hyper key to teach people how I set it up on the Mac OS. And then that way people, that again, it opens up just a whole new world. Cause I don't know about y'all, I don't really use caps lock. If I need to write something in all caps lock, I'll hold down the shift key. That's a small, small loss in product like sort of effort compared to like having to have this key that never ever does anything. So I see in the chat here, now you need a programmable keyboard so you can have meta keys that combine shift. So it'll never collide. Oh, okay. So actually, so tell me that was perfect. So actually I don't have, I did not program my keyboard to the hyper key because I know exactly what you're talking about. I always thought that limiting yourself to the, well, sorry, <laughs> limiting is a bad word. Programming hardware is very cool, but the problem is, is that when you're, you don't have your hardware, you're kind of, you're screwed, right? So the perfect example is your laptop. You can't exactly swap out your keyboard for an external one unless you just like bring your mechanical keyboard that you've programmed everywhere you go. And so I actually do it basically via software. So actually, I'm just going to tell you all what it is right now. I won't do a deep dive into it, but if I can actually just find it. Okay, I think I did it. Oh, oh carabiner elements. Okay, yeah. So basically, again, just like a quick shout out to what it is, Carabiner Elements, this is what I'm using. I think there's something you need to pair with it. But basically, you download it, you give it permission, and it allows you to combine, basically customize some key stuff. So once again, I'll do like a whole guide on that at some point. But in the meantime, for those looking to do it uh, programmatically, or sorry, via software, not like you don't have to make any hardware changes, Carabiner Elements is what I use to hotwire my caps lock key so that it's become a hyper key. Cool. So, okay, I got Elena here in the chat. I found a video the other day and just curious, have you heard of Dendron? Okay, I'm gonna see, let's see, Dendron. Oh, actually, so the, the short answer is no, I have not heard of it, but, oh, actually, no, wait, no, I think I have. I have heard about Dendron. Okay, so it looks like it's a note-taking. Okay, there's schemas. I do like that. Cache everything. Cool. Notes that grow daily. Okay, there's a daily journal. That's common. Oh my god. Uh, I don't I sometimes I wish that sites didn't do that scroll position where it like forces you to scroll through the animation. Uh, I have like mixed feelings about that sometimes. Okay, so that's fine. Developers like Dendron, sure. Oh, is it a plugin into VS Code? Is that how they're doing it? Interesting. Because my first question is like, how Kevin, Lynn, Jonathan, this is cool. Oh, I like their team page. That's nice. 
Okay, I'm yeah, I, I okay, I'm gonna Elena, I'm gonna add this onto the list of things to kind of look into. And then that way we'll give a shout out. But again, I'll add this to the resources for anyone who's looking at this. So it looks like it does look like another app, a note taking app, but it might follow the convention I'm hoping to see, which is that I think it is data first. It looks like it integrates directly into VS Code. So that seems interesting to me, getting started. Yeah, install VS Code, install gender. Okay, so. This reminds me of Foam. So you know what? Honestly, there probably is an opportunity here for like a Foam and Dendron episode because I think they would overlap in that regard. So this is definitely interesting. So thank you for the suggestion, Elena. I will add this to the list and actually I'll make that as a note actually. Dendron plus Foam VS Code session. Cool. Yes, okay, Elena here, you can create local vaults. Okay, that's great. As you know, as a lot of you probably know, a huge fan of Local First. So the fact that they're pushing this kind of idea too, very, very interested to see what their uh, sort of user experience patterns are. And I see Dave in the chat. What's up? How's it going? Okay. Cool. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. What I missed a couple of other things. Let me look in the chat. What's actually not good on Mac? Moving files. Perhaps I am also working too awkwardly. Oh, moving files. This is, you know, it's funny you mentioned this radio signal because I actually think when I'm moving files, usually I'm moving it. Nope. Yeah, moving files is actually painful. I found that actually I liked kind of VS Code's path for that. So here, if I'm inside of, let me see, let me open my Ben Kozen project, for example. So if I want to move the 2018, I can just move file. No, okay, I know I know what pattern I'm talking about. I'm talking about Obsidian. This is where I think Obsidian has established a pattern that works really well. So that if we're in the productivity power hour, number three, and we're like, hey, we want to go ahead and move this somewhere, it's as simple as command P, move to another folder, choose whatever folder. And so actually now that I'm saying this, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, if I had like file search build with Ben 25 and I wanted to move, oh, oh, I can trash stuff. That's cool. But it doesn't look like I can move the directory. Copy file, copy path. Oh, that's cool. I like copy path. That's cool. All right. So maybe this is like a feature we can request because you're totally right in that it would be nice if Raycast could actually move a page for us similarly to how uh, Obsidian allows us to do. So we just actually, let me just go back one more just to make sure. Move file. No, migrate. Oh, migration assistant. I don't even know what that is. Okay, that's fine. So it looks like we can't move stuff with the Raycast, but that honestly is a really good call out. I think that would be great. Here, Nunchi here with the comment, five finger hotkey would be like Tom Cruise in Minority Report. Nice reference. Yeah, so the five finger hotkey, no, one, no one's ever gonna do it. So hence, hyper key, pretty awesome. All right. So, all right, we've talked about window manager. <laughs> we've only talked about the window manager. We're okay. I still got I still got good content for y'all. Okay, so the window manager again, very very cool, and I love that they've done so much from like, wait, they haven't almost maximized. That's new. Okay, so for example, what other window management stuff do I do constantly? I like full screening things, right? Like if I'm paying attention, like let's say I whoop whoop whoop. Let's say I'm here and it's currently like left 50%. I want to be able to go 100%. And so for me, that's like caps lock F. So I hit two keys and then it full screens immediately rather than me having to like go up here and then hit the thing to maximize. But then you, we all know what happens when you maximize it. Then that becomes like a desktop window and then it's kind of tricky stuff. So hence why, again, being able to just go like this here, there's my two thirds, there's my one third, you know, VS code on the left, research on the right. Or, you know, if I don't need the VS code to be as big, you know, or I'm taking notes, then that can be left, that can be right, done. So window management, huge, huge unlocking capability. So even if you don't want, if you're even if you're not big on hotkeys, the ability to at least let Raycast do that work for you rather than you manually sizing it will just open up your workflow again. And again, I would, in my opinion, in pretty big ways. So, all right. Here is something else I actually discovered in along with my research, but I actually really like. So what Raycast also has is the concept of floating notes. 
And so when you hit it, it basically is the post-it sticky note that some of you might be familiar with with Windows. And in fact, I think Mac might even have its own equivalent native, but I like the fact that this is built in the Raycast, so I'm, I'm shouting it out. So that like, if we're in the process of, let's say in this, actually, you know what, we'll, we'll talk about Dendron another time. Let's talk about Caribbean, oh, no, let's not talk about, let's talk about Raycast, right? So be like, oh yeah, Raycast, I can make some notes. Oh yeah, it's about productivity. And then I can switch over to other things, right? And so what is nice is it's basically like absolute positioned over everything and then allows you to basically have this little bit to like copy and paste for later. And so, oh, I can change the color too. Ooh, oh, I like this. Yeah, I'm gonna go with blue. Cool, okay. So it's cool, right? You can copy the text, you can switch it to reminders, notes, this is cool. And so what I like about this is that sometimes like it's a lot to manage windows when you're sort of like, Basically, when you want to take a quick note, and let's say you're not in the, like, what's a good example of this? Let's say you're presenting at a work meeting, and you want to make a quick note, but you want to open your Obsidian, because you can't remember what the last thing you opened was, so the last thing you want is everyone to see your Obsidian, and you don't have multiple screens. Well, being able to take a quick note inside of here is great, because it sits here, like, absolute positioned, and it's like Z index 999999, and so as a result, what you get is the fact that you won't forget that this thing exists. Because I, like my biggest problem is when I take a note in another app and then it like gets hidden somewhere because like my context switch is that I forget that I took the note and then I forget to like process it and then it just gets lost. So with this floating note concept, now I don't even have to worry about that. And more importantly, if I close this, I can always reopen it back up and then Raycast will have it actually cached. So this is really like, again, this is a new feature I'll probably be using quite a bit, not only during meetings, but just general, like if I'm not sure, I just want to throw something quickly down. This is great. Okay, now that we talked about this, let's talk about the next favorite feature I have, which is the fact that it has API integrations. And so what do I mean by API integration? So a lot of us, as you know, you probably know that I, I do a lot of development. Okay. So as developers, frequently, what would we find ourselves doing? Well, we often need to go get a repo. We might need to go look at a repo. And so what is our usual workflow? Well, we probably open up Chrome and then we probably go to github.com. And then let's say I'm looking for a demo that I built recently on like Vue 3 and Netlify forms. Well, then I'd have to like go, oh, I could go here. I could search actually, although actually I just realized this thing even exists, but I could go like Vue 3 Netlify. Okay, apparently it doesn't show up. So that was useful, or that was useless. <laughs> and so I could go here, I go to repositories, and then there, then I go to, uh, let's say I didn't see the Netlify forms at the very top. And actually, let me just do view three Netlify, to the same exact term. See, that's weird. The same exact term shows something up on this page, but didn't show up in the widget. And even in me just sort of explaining this, that was a decent amount of work to like switch context, especially when you want to move forward with something. Like, okay, you know you need to access this. So why couldn't we do this the same level of integration with the launcher? And so uh, once you authenticate with Raycast, basically, all you have to do is you go, oh, what do I want to do with GitHub? Oh, I want to search a repository, great. And I want to do view three Netlify. What have I done? When, oh, there's my Netlify forms, enter, boom, there you go. I don't have to bookmark something. I don't have to like, cause I, that's what I used to do. I used to like create macros for all of my repos that I frequently had to go check out and I don't have to do that anymore with Raycast. And so more importantly, I, like you said, you, we could like create issues here. So I could be like, oh yeah, create an issue. Okay, this one is a little bit uh, slower, but like where am I creating issues, right? So this is like, some of this is not as practical for me, I would say. So again, what other GitHub integrations do you have, right? You can see all the pull requests you've had. You can check out your notifications, open issue, etc. But I would say, just being able to search a repository and open it within a couple of uh, keystrokes, super, super useful. And so this is just the beginning though, right? Because Raycast is designed on a JavaScript API. So I think particularly for React developers, you can celebrate because I think a lot of the UI is written using React components. And so it should be fairly familiar for you all. And so obviously as a Vue developer, that doesn't mean that I can't contribute because again, the principles between frameworks, fairly easy to transfer, but I'm just saying that I think their native, like how you do components is Reacty rather than in the Vue way. Although funny enough, fun little trivia, according to the dev tools, we're using Vue on the Raycast.com page. So I think that's kind of funny. So that said, okay, what was I talking about? I was talking about, oh yeah, API, okay. 
So because the API integration is just JavaScript and allows you to do a bunch of stuff, this means that other integrations like one password and other things will basically start to, especially as the ecosystem starts to grow, we're going to see more and more of this stuff. So I believe if I look at even like, oh, look, so Figma, oh, wait, that's the application Figma. That's not what I wanted. So I think if I go to my preferences and extensions and we go to like Figma, for example, oh, it looks like, yeah, okay. They said there was a store. Oh, you know what I have to do? Raycast store. So they're starting to like, I think this is in beta. So this is still something that they're still kind of trying to do, but you know, you can explore basically the different tools. So you can search your Figma files, for example, if you're a designer. And what I, what excited me about this is this is basically like starting to show the kind of interest that Alfred's community had. And that's what made Alfred really popular is that beyond what was built in, you have the community contributing their own workflows and that kind of stuff. And so one of the ones that I know, because Jimenez here on the stream, uh, one of my favorite workflows from Alfred that I didn't have a chance to really convert over yet is the ability to switch, like convert colors. So it was a simple thing that I could just be like, I could like put a hex color inside of Alfred and then it would pop out all the different conversions, right? HSL, RGB, etc. And so I haven't found a perfect one yet for this, but I do know like, here's like a script command that I found I was playing around with earlier where I could do something like, let's say like, again, E, you know, EF, 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 and then I want it in like RGB format, you'll see that it actually shows you like what this is here. Now, again, could it be prettier? Can it look better? Yes. But then similarly to how Alfred had like a way for you to program and write the UI to look pretty, I imagine that once we dive into scripts, which we'll talk about in a little bit, or we won't dive into it, we'll just cover it at a high level. I totally see it. Like, honestly, if no one else puts it, I would love to have that utility again because I lo loved being able to see my, not only my hex color, like represented, so it's seeing the actual hex color, but then actually being able to convert it really easily to HSL or RGB so that I could be like, oh, okay, that's what its equivalent is. Because for anyone who's done any sort of CSS color refactoring, you'll know that when you're staring at hex colors, you're like, I don't know the difference. But if you have something like an HL, HSL format, which is honestly my preferred color way of storing colors, in CSS, it's really easy to be like, by the way, these two grays that you have stored inside of here are literally 1% apart. We don't need, like, the human eye is not going to be able to tell the difference between the 1%, and we can combine those to say, do you prefer the 10% or you prefer the 9%, right? And so that's what I really love about HSL. It makes it very easy to make those sort of comparisons compared to RGBs, which again, don't really make sense to people unless you have a lot of practice with it. I think there are a select few people in this world who probably could, based on the RGB colors, tell like RGB hex code. Or not, why do I keep saying RGB? I mean hex. Who could tell based on the hex code what color it is and what hue and whatnot. I am not that good. So having the color workflow is a great idea. So yeah, so yeah, Jimena here confirming what I was saying. So actually, you know what? I'm gonna, I think I have my workflow somewhere. Let me see, can I do out? Okay, so let me open up Alfred. Let me see, do, 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 do. What do I wanna do? Oh yeah, 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 okay. Yep, 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 Here, workflows, that's what I wanted. So add workflow, do, do, do. Oh, not that. I wanna import one. How do I import? For template examples. Okay, hold on. I'm gonna open up file search. So this is me using Alfred snippets. Here's my Alfred folder. Here we go, my colors workflow. So let me import this real quick to show you what happens. Okay, here we go. So let me just demo it real quick because I realized why, why. And by the way, so you see how Raycast made that really easy for me to find the file? I didn't have to like go figure out which Dropbox it was in and then which vault and ah, uh, didn't have to do all that. Anyways, so now magic, here we go, one, two, three. Three, eight, three, five, four, D, F. There you go. Look at that. It's so pretty. And oh, I, I don't like that. That's one thing I, I didn't like about. That's one thing. Okay. So actually there shows you a difference between um, Alfred and Raycast is that once I accidentally lost, lost focus from Alfred, it just disappeared. <laughs> All my work just went poof. Whereas Raycast actually stores my state. So that's why when we were earlier, when we were doing like file search, when I was doing like Alfred file search right here, if I hit escape, or actually not escape, because that'll, that'll delete. If I go to a different context, like my Chrome window, like I've done, like I frequently do during the stream, then if I go back to Raycast, you'll see it actually persists the state of what I was in. And that I really, really like because when I'm switching context, I am often flipping back and forth. 
And so, for example, if I were switching between VS Code and my colors, I want to be able to see that and then make comparisons. But with Alfred, right now, again, once again, if I just make up a color, you'll see that, oh, this is a really cool magenta, great. And then you'll see, look, it's one, it's beautiful because you can see all the different, heck, like how the, we can see the color represented. But more importantly, we can see what it's like within the hexadecimal, RGB, in percentages. You even have the HSLs. I love that. And then I can hit enter and copy it. But what happens if I accidentally lose focus of it? If I lose focus, hit, and then open up Alfred again, you'll see it's gone. So this is where an example of how Raycast takes that sort of one step forward yet again. And so I see Hung Su in the uh, chat. What's up, man? Ah, good to see you. Let's see. So what? I see a comment about HSL love. What? HSL love? No. Here you have C love. Okay. So what does this mean? Human friendly alternative to HSL. So are you saying HSL love extends on the saturation to span all the chroma as a neat percentage? Oh, that's, huh. Oh, this is very cool. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to obviously need to drop this as a resource. So for all the HSL lovers out there, check out this site. That is very neat. I like it. Thank you for the suggestion. Oh, and then Hung Su here. Okay. HSL has a weakness in that the colors are at supposedly the same lightness are much lighter or darker, such as blue or yellow at the same lightness. That is something I have noticed when refactoring. Sometimes it doesn't capture the nuance as well. So I, I think for me that con gets outweighed by the benefits of being able to easily analyze colors. But that said, for those who are like, who need the nuance, what I always recommend is if you want to then store your hex values as you would normally in like your CSS variables. And then in the comment next to your hex value, that's where I drop the HSL value because then, then you don't have to deal with like if HSL lacks the nuance to convert properly and it misses a percentage for whatever reason. And then as a result, you get still like base analysis of HSL, but you get the nuances of like a hex. So very, very nice. Okay. So let's see. Uh, Wingmat. Hey, what's up, Wingmat? That's super helpful. I have to look at those conversions up all the time. Exactly. So again, Alfred has already a built-in workflow for this. And I found a color conversion for Raycast, but it's not as nice as the Alfred one. So in another session, I'm pretty much sure we're going to do this at this point. We're going to do a Raycast scripting, which we're going to talk about a little bit before the show wraps up. And in that, I think, honestly, we should probably just try to build it. That's probably what I want to do. I'll probably get the JavaScript done in advance, and then we'll figure out how to script it over. So if someone hasn't built it by then, I think that's what we'll build together because I love having this color workflow. Okay. So radio signal here, this would actually be all be a job for Siri. Voice control should play a greater role. That's an interesting perspective. It would be nice if, well, the, the thing about voice control though, to, to me, radio signal is that what happens when you need to like, because it relies on your memory to store what Siri or whatever voice assistant says back to you. And so it, can you imagine if you're like, you know, I'm not going to say, I'm be like, hey, voice assistant, convert my HSL color to this. If they read it out, there's no way to kind of see and scan and kind of process it. So I think that's the one downside, or one of the downsides of having a voice assistant kind of do it all. So again, I'm all about like choosing the best from both worlds. And so this is why, for example, voice assistants, however, are really good for things like when you're in the kitchen and you're like trying to figure out the conversion for like cups to fluid ounces or teaspoons, tablespoons. It's nice for the voice assistant to just tell you that kind of stuff. And so in that regard, I agree. I think that's where voice assistant can be actually great. So, okay. Now, now that we've demoed this, now we've talked about integrations, we talked about like the workflows. Now we're gonna talk about my favorite feature about Raycast, which arguably it existed inside of Alfred as well, but I think, I don't know, I've come to really like the UI for Raycast, and that is the Clipboard History Manager. And I know this might sound very like pedestrian, very, very like, what? Your favorite feature is the clipboard manager, but I, 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 how do I say this? I can't say how many times where I've watched people copy things 
and then they're sort of like switching back and forth that they lose contact and then they copy the same thing. And so if I hit, all I have to hit for my clipboard history manager is I hit alt V. So instead of command V for like paste, it's alt or option V. Sorry, I see saying alt. Option V, option V will open the clipboard history manager. And if you take a look, it has everything that I've copied recently, but more importantly, it's filterable. So I can be like, ah, oh, yes, I. what are my Twitter things that I've copied recently? Oh yes, here are all my Twitter things. I can look at the preview of all the things. And once again, I have all the same functionality of like command K to like do other things, to paste the clipboard, open it in the browser. Like it has a way to detect different types. And so you can even, you know, delete entries if for whatever reason you don't want your, the clipboard history to contain something, then you can always wipe it. But I mean, the ability to search your clipboard history is just so great uh, for so many reasons, because if you're talking about unlocking workflow, think about how many times when you're in something, you're trying to copy one thing and then you have to switch context over and then you have to go back and copy this other thing. What if you just copy things sequentially? So let's say, for example, we want to copy both of these links and I want to drop it inside of the Obsidian for later on for the show notes, right? Typically you would go, okay, well, I'm going to copy here. I'll copy the link address and then I'll go paste. And then I'm going to click here and then I'll copy link address. Then we go paste. That's like a lot of boom, 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 boom. But instead I could, again, I just copied it twice. Look at my clipboard history manager. And now I go, oh, okay. Yeah. That's the one I want to do. Copy the clipboard paste. Oh, what's the next one? Oh, it's this one. Okay. Copy it, paste done. Right. And so it's so good like the clipboard history like this is for for those who aren't using clipboard history managers honestly i think most of the time or again there's I, there's never 100 percent on anything but for just a little bit of effort i feel like you unlock a lot rather than like oh did i did it copy because sometimes that's what i ask myself too i was like oh did i copy that and clipboard history manager tells me immediately if i did or not and so if you want to configure that I don't know if it's built in my default, but I can, again, I, uh, just for the sake of the uh, workflow here, you would just look for clipboard history inside of your extensions. And then you'll see, you can just like basically turn on the hotkey to whatever it is. And, oh, I didn't even mention this. The other thing I love about Raycast is it has the concept of aliases too, which as for those who have followed me from my obsidian stuff, I love aliases because when it comes to personalizing productivity tools, aliases are an absolute godsend when it comes to being able to do things the way your brain wants it to. So if, let's say, for example, uh, clipboard history is too hard for us to remember. And we're like, ah, we want to call it capybara for whatever reason. Now, oh, did I not? I didn't hit enter. Capybara, enter. Oh, can I? Hey, let's, wait. Oh, that's kind of sad. All right, let's call it capybara. All right, capybara, whatever. Kind of interesting they're limited to six characters. Okay, that I find th that's a questionable decision I'm into in my mind. All right, now that we have this, what happens? Well, if we do Capiba, there we go. So similar to Obsidian, right? We have the ability to see that it automatically brings up clipboard history, but we can see on the alias right here, boom, boom, that um, we have the alias. But also, look, check it out. You also see your hotkey that you've bound to it. So. I love this reinforcement of information in that you're like, okay, well, if you forget what the hotkey was, it's not like you have to go and bury it. And so for example, what is my full screen, you know, toggle full screen management? Oh, it didn't show up there. Well, anyways, I do like that. I did like that that showed up. Now let me get rid of copy bug because I don't need that. But hey, mana here. Yes, you awesome. Yeah, the, the character limit is weird. There's only one reason I can think of right now that would be somewhat reasonable, which is that earlier, okay, let me just put Capiba back real quick. All right, so Capiba is here. My theory is, and this is one of the things that I think we'll have to iterate on like these sort of like command prompts we're seeing that are becoming more and more popular over time, is that how do we do a multi-line stuff? Like that's why I think it's they don't want you to do that. It's because there is already enough going on in that that they don't want it to be super noisy. I don't love that because I think Obsidian found a good middle ground with that, right? So here we can come to Obsidian. And if I do productivity power hour or like PPH number two, 
you'll see that it handles it in that like the alias goes on top and then whatever the original thing goes below it. I think this is honestly, this design pattern works really well for me because there's like what my brain is looking for and also like a, a, a small reference to what the source of it is. And so if anyone from the Raycast team is watching, that's what I recommend. So that way you can allow people to have different aliases that are a lot longer in the event they need it, right? Because isn't that the whole point of aliases is to allow users to personalize it. And so, I mean, six characters is really, really short, right? We're not even talking like, te like 10 or, I don't know. I would say I'd want at least 15, I think. But anyways, that's neither here nor there. Just a little bit of feedback. So six characters is a smidge too short, I would say. Okay. So, all right, we have 10 minutes left. All right. So we've talked about some of my favorite features of Raycast that I've worked with so far. And so the question here from Nunchi that we had though, is whether those things can be exported. And so what we see here is we have the ability to export your backup preferences, quick link snippets, notes, script to command, folder pass, aliases, hotkeys, favorites, and other data. So the answer to your, ans uh, sorry, the answer to your question is yes. You can absolutely export your preferences from Raycast, which is great. The only thing I think they could do to improve this, which I think Alfred did this well, is that I wish it wasn't a manual export. I'd rather it be like, this is where I want to sync my file like, and just keep it updated, right? That's what would help the experience a little bit more. But at the bare minimum, they let you export it. So at the bare minimum, you have that. Yeah, because I see Amena um, sort of uh, agreeing with me in the chat because Again, this is a, that is a fairly common pattern nowadays for productivity tools to basically tell it what folder to sync all its stuff to. And that way you don't, as a user, you're not ever stuck with the situation of like, you forgot to sync something and then you lost all your preferences, which for those of us that spend a lot of time doing this stuff is an absolute nightmare. So yeah. So with that said, I mean, it's kind of interesting stuff here though. Look, by the way. Show Raycast on the uh, screen containing the mouse. This is cool. So you can actually define where it shows up. I like that preference. Pop to root search. I have, oh. Oh, okay, interesting. This is the persistence that I was talking about. So it looks like you can actually set how long the state persists, which actually, actually now that I think about it, I do like, because there probably is a bandwidth in which the, pers the context is useful. And then after that, you want to go back to the original Raycast. So. Pop to root, again, I think the, the, the name pop to root search is a little bit odd, but whatever, I kind of understand. <laughs> Auto switch input source. Do, 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 do. Eh. Okay, anyways, so that answers that question. Okay, now let's talk about the things I would like to look more into that I kind of, I want to mention for those who want to like go off on their own and explore is that Maybe what I've said so far is not a, not convincing enough for people who are hardcore Alfred users who are like, ah, I just I'm not sure it's for me. And so the other thing that I want to cover here is that, so they happen to all start with S's for Raycast. So Raycast also has built-in snippets, which I think Alfred lets you do too, but this one seems a little bit easier to do in that if we create a snippet to call it like, if I want a PPH to become like productivity power hour, for example, that's like my, and so that I could create the snippet. Then I think what happens ultimately is I go PPH, or uh, wait, do I go PPH snippet? Wait, I created the snippet. Snippet, search snippets, PPH copy. That's a little slow. The fact that I don't really know how to use it. So it might not be the Raycast fault at all. It might just be a little bit slow with it, but snippets are nice. Cause right now I use a different app to manage that. However, though, a limitation I'm already seeing with, oh, oh, oh my gosh. Okay. Hold on. I, I get that in a second snippets here. Yeah. I, I'm not accessing that quickly. The one thing though, I can already tell that I would love to see Raycast provide for us is the ability to have dynamic pieces of data inserted into snippets. So for example, I use keyboard maestro a lot for things like inserting the current date or timestamps or dynamically fetching something. It'd be nice to have variables inside of here. So that would be kind of cool. But uh, the re I'm going to switch gears real quick because we have uh, a Raycast dev here in the chat. Hello, hello, Pit Nicola. How's it going? Okay, so some of the questions are being answered in here. Let's see. So the clipboard history is being stored in an encrypted database. Okay, great. Good to know. Oh, yeah, that's the other thing. Raycast is, see, at least 
from the manifesto and everything, very big on like the data is stored locally. So it's not, so I am not paying for like a Raycast cloud that's syncing all my preferences. So another reason to love Raycast is that all local first. Okay, regarding character limit and aliases, <laughs> we'll increase it. Originally, it was meant for simple things like FS and DEF, etc. But yeah, some people want to use longer words. Excellent. That is fantastic to hear. And so Pit Nicola also here talking about how snippets are going to be enhanced with richer features going forward. So that's very exciting as well. So this is also another reason why I am very excited about the Raycast ecosystem is because even with what you have right now, it is actually already leaps and bounds, I would say, ahead of Alfred. Short of, there's one exception, is if you have a lot of built-in workflows you've customized, then that's, I would say, a clear example of where you probably don't, Maybe you don't have the time to migrate everything over. And so maybe maybe you don't want to use Raycast in its entirety. But otherwise, for those who are been using mostly built-in Alfred features, and I think Raycast is very well worth the jump for the amount of effort and fantastic. Yes. So it <laughs> colors to the list. I love it. You know what? Honestly, we, we're probably going to end up building that together. That's my guess. Okay. So as we start to, a couple other things that I'm very excited to look into, which we'll do in another session, is you can actually integrate your short, your Apple shortcuts with Raycast because I didn't mention this earlier, but at the moment Raycast is Mac OS specific. So unfortunately, PC users, you you luck out again when it comes to productivity tools. They seem to generally be in the Mac ecosystem for whatever reason. So as a result, though, for those of us in the Apple ecosystem, you get shortcuts. You could integrate that directly with Raycast stuff, which is very cool. So I love that. We'll have to look more into that. But the coup de gras of all this stuff that I really want to look into is scripting with Raycast. And so there's a lot, there's like a whole documentation with this, but to show you some of like the scripts, so let me, can I look at existing scripts? How do I look at script editor? No, that's not what I want. I had the ability to see all my scripts at one point. I guess reload script directory. Okay. A scripts, file search script. Weird. Okay. Anyhow, scripting is as it, it sounds, oh, it's in preferences. Great. Preferences, general, not that, not that. Scripts, script editor. Yeah, but how do I see my exist? Oh, here we go. Here's my existing scripts, script commands. Here we go. Okay. And then I can open this up. There you go. So I can open it. Oh, whoa. I broke my terminal. That's not what I wanted. I wanted to edit it. Show in finder. Oh, can I command K on this? I cannot command K. Okay, anyways, here's the convert colors that I was playing around with earlier. So we can see here. So this is like a basic bash script. So, but here's the thing though, it takes other languages too. The scripting is not limited to that. So that's why earlier when we were doing the create script command here, we can see we got a lot of other things and Node.js is on here. So I'm excited to check that out. Yeah, and to pit Nicholas point here, it is actually on, here's a bunch of script commands that are built by the community. So. Basically, what I'm saying here is that we're going to have a whole episode devoted to Raycast Ray, Ray scripting because I'd love to see how easy it is to get in there. And more importantly, I'd love to start building some of the things that as clear, clear as day to me that a lot of people love the color utility that I showed earlier from Alfred. So if it hasn't been built by someone at this, by the time we do it, we'll build it and we'll share it um, back to the open source as is the philosophy. So super excited for that. So with that, yeah, let's switch on over and wrap things up. Okay, great. <laughs> all right, with that, a huge thanks to Pit Nicola for stopping by and answering questions and dropping all these amazing resources. Really appreciate it. So we've taken a look at Raycast, which again, I'm super excited about, and it's basically become a core part of my productivity workflow now. So really excited to follow on the community and we'll certainly be sharing any tips or tricks and more importantly, we'll be checking out Raycast scripts soon, I would say. I don't know what day yet, but We'll follow the schedule. So if you want to check out the schedule for the next time, we'll be checking out Raycast, Raycast scripts. Be sure to check out the schedule at www.bencodezen.io slash schedule. As always, if anyone ever has any sort of questions or feedback regarding what we're talking about here today or has requests for future sessions, be sure to drop a comment below. I try to read every single one and respond to them. So all your feedback is greatly appreciated. And as always, all of the resources we talked about today will be included in the show notes and which will be down below. So with that, I think that's a wrap for today. So thanks to everyone for hanging out and I will catch you all another time. So talk to you later. Bye-bye.